There will come a day where we will be held accountable. And it's not that we can just come and say, you know, God, I'm, I was there in the service on Sunday morning. I, I, I was there every Sunday. Yeah, I know I live like a hell in the rest of the week, but on Sunday morning I was there. This was a case where, if it's the one I'm thinking about, uh, where the landowner uh, had tenants and he sent emissaries to collect rent and they abused and killed the emissaries. So then the landowner sent his son, thinking surely they won't betray my son, sent his son to collect the rent, and the tenants killed him. Right. Which is, of course, a tremendous allegory for God sent all the prophets, and they abused and killed them, and then he sent his own son, and he came into his own, and his own refu uh, received, him, received not. him not. Very good, very good. That's a quick version there. The, the idea behind this is when Jesus came in to town then, he basically, he wrecked the temple where the, the uh, house or the place of the Gentiles was, the court of the Gentiles. He wrecked it because that's where they were doing the money changes and all. And so the people were going crazy because Jesus came in and they were saying, save now. And they were praising God and they were thinking Jesus was the king. And they were, they were treating Jesus like royalty at this time. And he comes in and he throws the, the money changers out gets everybody out, and then the uh, Pharisees, the leaders of the temple, come to him and say, who do you think you are, basically? By whose authority do you do these things? And that's when Jesus tells this parable. And it's an absurd parable because of the fact that who in their right mind would kill people who were sent to collect rent that was due? Who would in their right mind? I mean, there's some times, I'm sure if you've had bad landlords, you'd like to kill them, but in your right mind, who would do that? Well, the absurdity of this is that the landowner continued to send people. That's the absurd thing here. The landowner had an unbelievable amount of patience with these people. And then they... He, they, he decides, well, I'm going to send my son. Surely they will listen to my son and they will pay what is due. And they kill his son. And, and they're, in their mind, if we kill the son, then we will get to inherit the land. Now, the absurdity of all of this to the people that he was talking to just must have blown their mind. And the thing that I want you to get out of this, and, and it's in your notes still, is whenever Jesus is being ludicrous, that's the point. The owner gives trust, he gives patience, but he gives judgment. Judgment. The farmers or the tenants, they get privilege, freedom, but they have responsibility. Now, one of the things that I do when I'm reading my Bible, especially if I'm studying a passage of Scripture, is I will often read three or four chapters before the passage and then maybe one or two after the passage if I think they're connected. And the reason why I do that is because a lot of times book, chapter, and verse will mess you up, okay? And I, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that as uh, somebody who studied the Bible for some time in book, chapter, and verse, a lot of times you stop right there and you don't realize there's continuity to what's going on. And a lot of times we miss that continuity. And one of the places I think we miss it is in this parable that is found in Matthew chapter 21. Because right after that, in Matthew chapter 22, we have some continuity to that parable. And the reason why I've entitled these lessons as Heaven's Guest List is because of the fact that I think Jesus was trying to show who was going to be on Heaven's Guest List. He started off with the ludicrous story of the farmer, farmers and the landowner, and now he's going to another ludicrous story in my mind. 
It says in, in, verse, in verse 1 of chapter 22, Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, Now, I in the past have always said, well, this is another time Jesus is talking because it says Jesus spoke to them again in parables. There is a chapter 21, and then we go to chapter 22. So as I'm reading my Bible in the past, I'm reading it. Okay, this is another time Jesus spoke. But when you look at it without the chapter and the verses, the two go hand in hand. And I want you to, I want you to think about that because a lot of times we break scriptures down too much and we don't realize that the things go hand in hand. But Jesus tells one parable, and that was to, in my mind, that was to the leaders and the Pharisees and the people of, that knew the law, the ones that were threatening to kill him, but they were scared because he had so much influence with the people at this time. But now he turns the story a little bit. And he spoke to them in a parable saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. Now, the only thing I can compare this to is what happened in 1981. Does anybody remember what happened in 1981? Princess Di and Charles got married. Y'all remember that? I had friends that stayed up all night to watch that. They were women, friends, because no guy is going to stay up all night to watch a wedding. As a matter of fact, women, let me explain this to you. The only reason they go to a wedding is for you. Guys don't like weddings. As a matter of fact, I, whenever I do a wedding, the women are always listening to every word I say. The men are checking the scores on their phone. That's what happens. But here's a situation where the king has invited people to a wedding. This one friend of mine, she stayed up all night and then she wanted to talk about this wedding and what all happened and everything. Of course, I was not interested, but uh, her and Nancy were talking about it and they were talking about all the details and they were, Oh, yeah, and I think Nancy watched some of the highlights or something. Yeah, I remember seeing that, and they were talking about all the things. But I was just thinking about my friend who stayed up all night to watch that wedding. I was thinking if she had been invited to that wedding, what she would have done to get there. She would have probably swam across to England <laughs> in order to be at that wedding because that's how important it took to her it was. Now there's been other royal weddings. I mean, uh, several people, I know you watched the queen's funeral and things like that. And I, I understand watching all those things. But when it comes to these folks today that he's talking to at this point in time, we don't have a king here, so we don't think anything about it. But the people of that day, they had kings. And so when they said, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son, all of these people perk up because when the king does something it's lavish and he says he sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come but they refused to come now i want you to understand this particular passage of scriptures in those days they would send out an invitation saying we're going to have a wedding and it's going to be at the end of november and you need to get ready because when it comes, we're going to send somebody to bring you to the wedding. And that's how the invitations go. They didn't have email. They didn't have the texting and all the things we had today. So the servants would be sent out into the land and they would tell everybody, there's a wedding coming. It's going to be at the end of this month. It's going to be during this time. And then they went out a second time and they told them, you need to be here on November the 23rd at 12 o'clock, because that's when things are going to start. Now, when you get invited to a wedding, you want to bring a gift. You want to do something for the couple that's married, but I'm thinking that this group of people were thinking when they're getting invited to a wedding for a king, what do you give to a king? You could bring flowers, but king has the best garden in the whole place. 
you could bring a bottle of wine and it would just go on the pile of all the other wines he has. There was nothing you could bring to this place because it was the king's. It wasn't like a potluck here at church where everybody had to bring something. The king was preparing it and he was putting it on the line and he sent his servants out and invited them to come. But it says right here, and this is where it gets ludicrous, but they refuse to come. They refuse to come. Weddings are the event of the year. A king's wedding, a king's son's wedding was the event of a lifetime in some cases. And he's going to marry his son off and you're invited to this wedding and everybody's listening and Jesus says, but they refuse to come. And I can just see all the people listening, hanging on every word. And when Jesus says, but they refuse to come, and they go, oh, what? That's crazy. Then he sent some more servants and said, tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered and everything is ready come to the wedding banquet now he's sending a second invitation the first one they refused to come he says look i've got everything ready i've got dinner ready i have my oxen ready i have fattened cattle that have been butchered and everything is set you need to come now now for those of you who are like me first thing I noticed in there that he had fattened cattle you know I went to Outback not too long ago and uh, I was really hungry and I ordered a bone-in ribeye I don't know if you know what a bone-in ribeye is but it's a big piece of meat and the little girl that was waiting on me, she said to me, Sir, before I serve you this bone-in ribeye, I must tell you a little bit about that cut of meat. And I'm like, okay. She says, well, that cut of meat is well marbled. And I said, uh, yeah. She said, well, I just have to tell you that because a lot of people don't like the marbling in the meat. And I said, ma'am, look at me. I'm well marbled too. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I like marble. You got extra marble back there, you bring it. So what he's saying here is this is a fattened cattle. This is somebody, this is a cat, this is the prime steak that you're going to eat here tonight. And he says, Everything is ready, come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off. One to his field, another to his business. The rest, look at this, seized the servants, mistreated them, and killed them. And the thing that I want you to realize is that you're being invited to the king's wedding. This is the king. This is the ruler of your providence that you're living in. This is the person you answer to. And one of them says, no, nah, I'm going to go off to my field. And the other one says, I've got some business to take care of. And the rest of the guys just sat around. They just, let's seize these guys and kill them for inviting us to a wedding. And everybody in the audience that Jesus was talking to were dumbfounded. They had their mouths hanging open. We know the story of a king and a wedding, but we've never heard of a group of idiots like this. He goes on to them. Then he, they paid no attention. The rest seized the servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army to destroy those murderers and burn their city. What? 
This is Jesus talking. He's talking about killing and burning. That's not the Jesus that we know, is it? But maybe it is. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet everyone you find. So the servants went out to the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good. I want you to underline that right there, the bad as well as the good, because that's where you are mentioned in the Bible. You are either bad or you're good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. Now, can you just imagine that you're minding your own business and somebody knocks on your door and says to you, the king has prepared a banquet. We want you to come. What if you got a letter from the president of the United States saying, I want you to come to the White House? Maybe that'll relate to you a little bit better. What, what would you first do? I heard of a fellow who got a call from uh, George Bush Jr. And it was the White House calling him, and, and I forget exactly what the circumstances were, but he was telling me he got this call from George Bush, and he asked them if he had the right number because he didn't expect this. And I just can't imagine the look on the people's faces when they heard that this was not the wealthy, this was not the elite, this was not the people of the top 10% that were being invited, this was just anybody, and they got the knock on the door. Or maybe the guy's walking down the street, walking his dog, and somebody comes up and hands him an a, a invitation and says, hey, you need to come to the wedding, and here's where it's at, and this is when it starts, and and he looks at him and says, is this for real? And the servant says, yes, I wear the insignia of the king. It's for real. You need to be there. So go to the streets, corners, and bank the bike when anyone who finds. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to see the guests... He knows, I mean, he's there already. He came. Shouldn't, shouldn't the king just kind of take a next step and do that? But that's not what he does. What he does, the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are invited, but few are chosen. Now I want to remind you of a couple of things here. Jesus came in riding a donkey, and people were screaming, save us. They were saying, come in power. They were saying, He's the king. And Jesus throws this parable out there and says, you're going to be invited, but if you don't come prepared, you're going to be thrown into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I am perplexed this is not the Jesus I like this is a Jesus that's harsh this is a Jesus that's not full of grace this is a Jesus that's judgmental and every time I read a story like that where I don't like that Jesus I take notice because I want to make sure I know the real Jesus 
You see, in today's world, everybody wants to talk about Jesus' love and Jesus' grace and how much God loves you, but there will come a day where we will be held accountable. And it's not that we can just come and say, you know, God, I'm, I was there in the service on Sunday morning. I, I, I was there every Sunday. Yeah, I know I live like a hell yeah in the rest of the week, but on Sunday morning I was there. I was, part of the, I was a part of the North Tampa Church of Christ. We, we had a great preacher too. At least that's what I'm hoping they'll say. But he says here, he says, the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot. Wait a minute. You invited him. You didn't tell him there was a dress code. But there is a dress code. Now, I want you to remember that who he's talking to. He is talking to the people who wanted to make him king. These are the people that threw their coats down. These are the people that threw the palm branches down, and he's talking to them. He's already covered the leaders of the church, and he's made them so mad that they want to kill him. And now he's talking to the mob that's come in and wanted to make him king. And he says to them, you're going to be thrown into outer darkness if you don't have the right clothes on. So here's the thing. The king prepares everything for joy and celebration. The king prepares everything for joy and celebration. As I was studying this today and looking over my notes, I decided that my sermon on Christmas Day is going to be about joy. You know, we talk about the, the song that we sing, Joy to the World, but Christ came to this earth and he's prepared a celebration for us. And it's everything, he's prepared for everything for joy and celebration. Now, here's the problem. The, king, the, the guests are indifferent, opposed, and unchanged, and they all suffer the same fate. The guests are indifferent, next slide, there we go, opposed and unchanged, and they all suffer the same fate. Now, I want you to hear this for those of you who are like me and spend time trying to talk to people about Christ, about becoming a Christ follower. Um, we had, uh, for those of you who are watching what's going on in the kitchen in there, we had uh, countertops put in today. And it looks great. Uh, Charlotte's doing a great job in there of matching everything and putting everything together. And the guy came in there, and it's, it's like the fifth time I've met this guy. He did some other work. He did some work for me personally and so forth. So it's like the fifth time. And I told him today, I said, look, I said, I've watched you work. It's time for you to come and watch me work. <laughs> and I've invited him before. And he says, I know, I know, and my wife wants to come and, and so forth. And, and I said, look, when you come, you let me know beforehand, and I'll take you and your family out to dinner. He's got two little kids, and uh, he's a great guy. I just love him to death. He may or may not show up. That's up to him. I did the inviting. But you see here... We're, no, go back. Guests are indifferent. We need to understand that there's going to be a whole world of people that are indifferent. They don't think Christians are bad. They don't think Christians are horrible people. They're just indifferent to what we're about. Now, I've run into those that are opposed, vehemently opposed. They think that because I am a Christian, I have lesser brain capacity than most people because they've been to college they've got a phd and they know there is no god and those two right there is something i deal with on a constant basis running into people and if you want to go out into the world and, and make disciples you need to understand you're going to run into those but the one that bothers me the most is the people that hear the gospel but they're unchanged. They're unchanged. 
I don't know if you pay attention to when I do the invitation a lot of times, but most of the time when I do the invitations, one of the things that I say in the invitation is if you truly worship today, you won't leave here unchanged. Because I know for a fact when you worship God, you're changed. But a lot of us come in here and we go through the routine. And, and, and brothers and sisters, I've been in the church my whole life. I know what it's like to go through the routine. When I was younger and growing up, my dad was the preacher. And I knew how, well, I knew when to stand up. I knew when to sit down. As long as they didn't change the order of the service, I was good. But every once in a while, they changed the order of the service, and I had to pay attention. But I, I grew up in a day where we didn't have overheads and things like that, and I would look at my dad, and I would watch him up there because he didn't move. I, the reason why I move is because if I'm preaching and I move over here and your eyes still stay there, I know you're gone to the Bahamas or someplace. Okay? But my dad stayed in the same place, and he preached the whole sermon in the same place. So I'd fix my eyes like I'm fixing my eyes on John right now, and I would have no idea what my dad was saying. And then I would come out of my comatose state when I heard the songbooks drag across the rack. I was like Pavlov's dog. Oh, yeah, it's almost over. I salivated and everything. And then we would have the closing prayer, and then I could go about my life again. You see, I was unchanged. And so many times we come to a Bible class, or we come and we worship, and we hear a sermon, and we know there's something about that sermon that we need to get for ourselves, and we do. The, the thing that I really hate is when people come to me after worship service and say, I really wish such and such was there to hear this. And I want to look at him and say, I really wish such and such was here to hear it, but I really wish you would have listened better too. <laughs> we can't go unchanged by the invitation to the king's celebration and the joy that awaits us. We can't go unchanged. So here's the invitation. Great responsibility comes with receiving great, great grace. Great responsibility comes with receiving great grace. And to accept the invitation is to accept change. You know, one of the things that I really wish that I could get across to people when it comes to doing communion on Sunday morning is that it's supposed to be a time of self-reflection. And one of the things that I do in my self-reflection, and you know, you gotta change things up or it becomes rote to you, it becomes like a habit. One of the things that I always ask God when I'm preparing for communion, uh, especially when we were passing trays and we had a little more time than we do right now, but one of the things I always try to get in my communion time is God is there anybody that I don't have the right relationship with right now is there any relationship in my life I need to fix and it may be that Jason's name comes up y'all are laughing like Jason's a problem <laughs> But it may be that, you know, there's something, Jason and I have had words, and not that we've ever had real words or anything. Well, we've had words, we've talked, but not, you know, bad words. But maybe, it may very well be that, you know, I'm feeling kind of harsh against Jason. And without fail, God will bring Jason's name or face to me while I'm partaking of communion. And I will know I need to fix that relationship. The other thing that I try to do when I doing communion i'm asking god okay god while we're in this communion time is there anything that i need to fix you know david in the psalm says search me O god and that's one of the things we need to do in communion is we need to ask god to search me 
And in doing so, we're going to accept change. Questions, comments, criticisms? Anybody? Yes, John, in the back there. Let's, let's get Jason, <laughs> get the microphone over to you. Um, so I don't know if this is true, it's, it's kind of a tradition, but um, that I've been taught before that when the king at that time would have invited people to the wedding, he would have also provided wedding clothes. So all they had to do really was just put them on and come prepared properly. I don't know if that's true, but that's kind of a tradition. Yeah, I, I, right, I, and I agree with you. I, I don't have any evidence of that. However, it, he provides us with our own righteousness. But the, the, are you familiar with Alfred Edersheim? No. Yeah, he would be the one that I would go to. He wrote. Uh, the Life of Christ, it's a, like a thick book, commentary. He wrote that, and he didn't have anything in there, and he also has a book called Customs and Traditions of the Bible. Yeah. And he's, a, he's actually a Jewish scholar that became a Christian. But I have not been able to find that anywhere, but if I could find somebody I could quote it, I would say that was, that was good. Right, but, and, and that, that's all I was going to say. is it, Whether it's true or not, I don't know, but it does kind of fit in the fact that Jesus wasn't necessarily being harsh to that man. He's saying, you had every opportunity right. to be prepared, right. and you weren't. That's true. Uh, so That's the, true. The, the second thing I was going to say is that you know, his audience there being the Pharisees, um, it, you, you could say that all he was doing there was being critical of them and kind of pointing out their flaws. But when we read Matthew 23, we see how heartbroken he was that the Pharisees would not change and they right. would not come around. Right. And so even in this set of parables, he's trying to get to their heart and say, come on, you know, I'm, I'm making it pretty clear to you that the, the prophets and, and all the people that are around you right now, they're making the same mistake. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't you pay attention? Right. And, and come back and, and be in the right mindset. So Very good. Yeah. Very good. Uh, down, down here and then back up to Jan. Bill, Bill has a comment and then Jan has one. Well, just to tie in with what John was saying, this <clears throat> points out why the religious elite of the time or the church people of the time were going to have a hard time making it to heaven because in their mind, they were okay. They were doing what they were supposed to do, and I had other things to do. I don't need to mess with what the king has to do. I, I don't need that. And, but it's the common person, the, the person that when the gospel is, is given to them, but not every one of them will, will respond appropriately either. But So there's two things that can really hurt you. One, those who think they know too much, those who think that they've gotten there on their own, which the Pharisees obviously did, and then those who just flat refuse it. And right. that's what this parable is all about. Right. Jan? It, um, it's interesting that the invitation went out twice. And the people had other things to do. In my mind, I've always thought that if I go to hell, and I'm not planning to, you know, part of hell will be a replay of every invitation I ever sat through, <laughs> knowing I was out of place. Right. And transformation is part of the invitation. Transformation is part of the songs that we sing. Transformation is part of hearing the scripture read to us. Transformation happens at the table. And transformation here it happens when the word of God is open to us. And I couldn't agree with you more. 
if we come to worship and we truly worship, you got to be transformed when you leave. Amen. Amen. That's one of the things that, you know, I pray consistently, and I do it sometimes with my prayers with others as well as by myself, but one of the things that I pray is, God, I want to know you better and love you more. And by saying that prayer, that puts me in the right frame of mind for the day. And that is a part of that transformation. I don't want spiritually to be where I'm at today next year. I want to have grown a little bit more and a little bit more. And the problem with a lot of us in the church, we're satisfied where we are. We're satisfied with a cottage below. So we can rename that song. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, Richard. Thinking about this uh, concept of, of the change again. You know, you've, you've probably seen, I, I, I've seen criminals who were, you know, they had pictures of them when they were arrested. And they look, you know, ragged and torn, and, ragged, and then they show up in court, and they, call it, you almost don't even recognize the guy. And uh, this idea of being clothed with new clothes, it's it's a transformation. Uh, Galatians three twenty seven says, as many of you has been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, carrying with the idea of being clothed in Christ. And uh, I, I just think that uh, what you're saying about coming every time we come, we should be changed. But unfortunately, I think we've the world, the religious world, has developed the concept that you can kind of just come as you are. And the just as I am concept is there. And I, I think it's important that we recognize that we come just as we are, but we don't stay as we are. You know, Christ changes us. He washes us and he puts, us new, puts new clothes on us. Mm -hmm. And it, it, the world wants to make it too easy. Yeah. Uh, Franklin Graham comes on TV every morning and talks about all you got to do is say this prayer. And if you said that, you know, and, the, and they, they literally teach that if you said that prayer, there's nothing that can keep you, you know, right. fr from going to heaven. Right. Uh, they want to make it very easy. And Jesus said it's not that easy. It's, mm -hmm. you know, the, the way is straight and the, the narrowest way. And he said even here, few, few, many, are, many are invited, but few are chosen. I, I particularly love um, reading Max Licato. And, you know, I know his doctrine's not always the way that I think it should be, but I love the book that he wrote, and I forget the title of it, but the book had a quote in it. It says, Jesus loves you just the way you are, but he loves you so much, he doesn't want you to stay that way. And I think that's the idea of being changed. Anybody else? Okay, real quick, turn over to Luke chapter 14. And uh, it says in Luke chapter 14, there's two scriptures in there, but Luke chapter 14, particularly starting in verse uh, 15, when one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast of the kingdom of God. And Jesus replied, now some people are tying this parable with the other. A certain man was preparing a banquet and invited many guests at the time the banquet. He sent his servants to tell those who had been invited, come for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have bought a field and I must go see it. What kind of person would buy a field without looking at it first? And if you're in here and you would do that, I have some swamp land I'd like to sell you. Please excuse me. The other says, I have just brought five yoke of oxen, and I am on my way to try them out. Who would buy oxen without trying them out first? Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. What? You're not getting married. You are married. I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back, reported this to the master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servants, go quickly out in the streets and the alleys and the towns, bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Serve the servant said, what you've ordered has been done. 
but there is still room. Then the master told his servants, go out on the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who are invited will get to taste my banquet. This is a very similar parallel. Now, the reason why I wanted you to see that is the absurdity of what Jesus is saying here. But I want to take you back now. I want to take you to Luke chapter 14, verse 1. Or, I'm sorry, verse 7. Verse 7. And the reason why I want to take you back there, because I want you to see something in here. We're talking about being changed. We're talking about banquets. He noticed how the guests picked out the places of honor at the table. He told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor for a person more dis, uh, dis, uh, distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come up to you and say, give this person your seat. Then, hu then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you're invited, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests for those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then Jesus said to the host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, this is to all of us, we need to listen to this. Do not invite your friends your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back so that you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. If you want to go away with what should I do with these stories of the banquet? You need to go away with taking people that are in less fortunate circumstances and giving of your means, taking them to a meal or feeding them at your house. And in doing that, you will be handed riches in heaven. I remember my father, I've still got time to tell this. I remember my father bringing a young man to our house. He had just gotten out of prison and the only place he could go because of his parole on Sundays was to church. So he called my dad, told my dad he had been baptized in uh, prison and wanted to go to church on Sunday morning. And my dad went and picked him up early on Sunday morning and brought him to church. And my dad always got to church, you know, like an hour or so before service started, brought him to church and had the young man sit in the auditorium so he could be out of the area that he was in. And then dad would do what he got to do and then we would all show up about an hour later and he would sit with us. But the thing that I will remember the most about my dad is after service was over, he would always take this young man out to lunch with the family or feed him. And I remember that because this young man would always say to my dad, there is no way that I can repay you for what all you're doing for me. And my dad would say, don't worry about it. I got it covered. And I knew my mom and dad's financial situation. And they lived in a time where the church's motto was, Lord, you keep him humble and we'll keep him poor. And they barely had enough to live on. But they always made time for those less fortunate. And it is ingrained in my DNA from watching my parents. And I would say to you today, that is something that we as Christians need to do because we take it from the words of Jesus. It says, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers, your sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. And when you look down here in verse 24 or 23, the master told the servants, go out in the roads, country lanes, and compel them to come, that the house will be full. Uh, I'm sorry, go back to verse 21. It says, the servant came back and replied, 
the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys and bring the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And those are the people that we are to be inviting. 